The presenters for today are going to be Mukesh Bhutani, founder at BMR Legal in India, and Parul Mittal, senior associate at BMR in India. Should you have any questions during the webinar, please type it into the question chat box and we will answer you at the end of the presentation. Now I give the floor to the presenters. Thank you very much, Gaia, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, depending on where you are dialing from. Uh, my name is uh, Mukesh Bhutani. I'm going to take you uh, through this presentation. Uh, the way we've organized our presentation is uh, that we are going to talk 45 minutes on some of the contemporary issues on international tax and transfer pricing by way of current developments. So what we intend doing, uh, you know, and, and this is just a basic uh, index that we have laid down that we wanted to cover obviously permanent establishment is big uh, but more importantly we will take a deep dive into uh, how do we see the web action plan 7 uh, from an indian standpoint uh, not just to uh, look at the pe avoidance but also to look at some of the important attribution principles uh, i just want to add that while we are going to take you through this presentation uh, we will talk about BEPS development we, by way of uh, reservations uh, that have been expressed by India. But we will also talk about some of the changes that have occurred in the domestic law, which are seen as implementing the BEPS measures. We are going to talk about some of the recent land landmark cases for permanent establishment. They have nothing to do with BEPS, but that would just give you a flavor for where India is going and more importantly, how Indian courts are looking at permanent establishment. We will talk about the never-ending debate on global formulatory approach versus arms length standard and where does India stand. We are going to talk about the general anti-avoidance. Just for everyone's knowledge, India triggered off its general anti-avoidance on April 1, 2018. And in a way, that largely coincides with implementation of BEPS recommendation. Clearly, as we see it today, the domestic GAR is creating some friction with the principal purpose test in the MLI, and we'll talk a little bit about that. On indirect transfers, which is popularly called the Vodafone law, we are going to talk about where do we stand on implementation of the law, and more importantly, what are the nuanced issues that are coming up as a result of the valuation principle. And we will end our presentation with uh, two important developments. Uh, one, the developments on intangibles and what India is doing on intangibles by way of uh, compliances uh, that it has uh, uh, that it has asked taxpayers to do and what view it has expressed. And finally, two other domestic law changes on secondary adjustment and interest cap, which came by way of changes in budget of 2017 uh, and we will talk about that as well now very briefly uh, just to recap uh, the four important areas uh, where the best action point focused upon which we are all aware of but i just want to refresh everyone's memory commissioner arrangements fragmentation of business activity a specific exemption list particularly the focus on preparatory and auxiliary and splitting of contracts I just wanted to give an Indian context before we try and look at it in the next slide. What is MLI saying and what is India doing? Number one, India follows common law. So typically commissioner arrangements are not recognized. Uh, on fragmentation of uh, cohesive business activity, we will deal with it in the slides later. As far as preparatory and auxiliary activity is concerned, this has been a major area of concern and dispute as well and we have seen some of the landmark cases decided either under the u.s treaty or under the japan treaty for landmark cases such as mitsui and nike wherein it has been held that by the courts that preparatory and auxiliary has to be given a wider definition and no matter what points of view india has expressed in the past on the OECD model convention, even before the BEPS exercise uh, was initiated, the courts have rejected the view 
of the Indian Tax Administration. So we will talk a little bit about that. Splitting of contracts is another important area of dispute for large taxpayers in India, particularly the one who are doing erection, procurement and construction contract. And because of uh, our uh, specific treaty provisions, uh, which provide for uh, the force of attraction rule, particularly on the Japan and the UK treaty that we will talk about. This slide essentially points out on the left, what is the MLI position? And I'm not going to focus a lot on that, on the presumption that all of us participating in this conference are familiar with it. And what is India's position? Well, on the commissioner arrangement, we all know that uh, the clear objective of the MLI driven exercise is to focus more on substance and less on form with a specific rider that if the undisclosed agent, uh, sorry, if the agent for an undisclosed principal habitually plays a principal role leading to conclusion of routinely concluded contracts without any material modification will constitute a PE. Now, there are several adjectives that has been used in the MLI document uh, as regards uh, the agents habitually playing contracts. And in interestingly, India held on to its view on many of these aspects in the position that tax administration took. However, the judicial view has been largely in favor of the taxpayers. In other words, we now see that if many of these clauses in the MLI are adopted as a integral part of the covered tax agreement, those treaty provisions will to some extent override established judicial principles in India. In other words, if India, let's say for instance, has followed a philosophy that situs of signing of the contract is important, the fact that some facilitation was given by the representative office in India for the purposes of signing of the contract is not relevant and hence it would not constitute a PE. Those situations will come now under the radar of the revenue. Also, India follows very strict based source rules and when it comes to establishing a permanent establishment, it holds permanent establishment due to place of management, it holds permanent establishment due to services that are performed, and it holds permanent establishment due to the dependent agent permanent establishment rule. So typically when you see uh, major audits in India, uh, the revenues attempt is to hold a PE on all counts. And similarly, the taxpayers attempt is to argue on all counts. And so far, the courts have been largely in favor of the taxpayers. So some of the commissioner arrangements will come under question. On specific exemption activity, uh, India has essentially opted for option A, which as you know, are much more stringent uh, than option B. And it goes into the functions of what is core and what is non-core rather than simply following the, whether the activities are preparatory and auxiliary in nature. In other words, it's one thing to say that my activities are preparatory and auxiliary in nature. However, you need to give a context to that activity. Do they form a part of your core activity? If they do, the fact that they are preparatory and auxiliary in nature will not be of any relevance on a go-forward basis. As far as splitting of contracts is concerned, uh, there is no notification or reservation expressed by India. So all that has been laid down in action point six as regards splitting of contracts by using what the MLI calls it as a related entity uh, uh, will, 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 will trigger in and then all all the activities that are performed by the non-resident and the associated enterprises of non-resident will also be factored in. And this is particularly relevant if you read India's position 
on some of the treaties, particularly the UK and Japan on force of attraction rule, because these treaties use the word profits directly or indirectly attributable. And if you look at the trend of treaties in the last four years that India has signed, this force of attraction rule is applicable in all the treaties. Having said that, I think the interpretation of the force of attraction rule in India is very different than what is done internationally. And some of the leading examples are with the UK based uh, foreign law firms. And there is a famous case of Linklaters that lays down the principle on force of attraction rule. Now, some of these decisions are still up for adjudication before higher appellate forum. So the UK law firms case is one set of cases are before the High Court in Mumbai and the other set of cases are before the Supreme Court. Now let's try and come at what developments have occurred in the domestic law as regards implementation of MLI positions. Now, some people label this as a unilateral development. However, we'll try and explain that they may sound unilateral on the face of it, but there is a rationale why they have been introduced in this year's budget. So today, uh, in, in 2018 budget, uh, India introduced what they call it as two changes to the business connection rule. We do not, and I'll just take a minute explaining the business connection rule. We do not have a concept of permanent establishment under the domestic law. We have a concept of business connection. And the business connection is a deeming fiction. One positive way of looking at it is that Indian courts have held that when it comes to determination of permanent establishment, we will look at and read the treaty. But if you are not dealing with the treaty, we will read the business connection rule. Over the years, the business connection rule definition has been expanded in order to reinforce the strict source-based rules. For example, in 2012, when the government lost the Vodafone case as regards transfer of shares in an offshore company, which triggered off, uh, a, which triggered off a transfer of interest in underlying assets in India, they amended uh, the business connection rule. Similarly, in the 2018 budget, they have again amended the business connection rule primarily to deal with two situations, expanding the dependent agent permanent establishment definition and second, introducing some form of a digital tax. Now, please bear in mind that in 2016, India also introduced the equalization levy, which was like a fixed uh, tax. They don't call it tax but it is not VAT either, uh, which meant that uh, all the payments that are made for, uh, for digital advertising to a non-resident company was suffering an equalization levy of 6% of the payment. So the significant economic presence test introduced in the 2018 budget is over and above the equalization levy. Now, both these cannot apply together but certainly there is a confusion or rather there is a choice that has been given now to the tax administration for use of digital levy on specified transaction, which are largely B2B for advertising purposes and the interplay of significant economic presence. But the economic significant presence in our view does not get triggered in until the time the MLI is implemented and we'll try and explain that. But very briefly, uh, if you look at the slides, what is broad basing of the dependent agent PE definition? Well, it says that it includes business activities carried out on behalf of a non-resident who habitually concludes contracts or habitually plays the principal leading role for the conclusion of contracts. Whether the non-resident has a presence in India or not, uh, whether they are providing uh, in, in services, uh, it would be all in that context. And if you read this expanded definition with the MLI position uh, as regards 
commissioner arrangement you will see similar words have been used now why have they used this words which are slightly at variance to the words that have been used in the mli simply because these words negate administrative circulars which specifically exempted non residents from procuring goods out of out of india and not being subjected to any form of business connection so let me give you a very simple example suppose a non resident has an agent in india the agent in india helps procures goods now the agent is remunerated for the commission but still the non resident does not create a business connection in india or the non resident is not deemed to have a permanent establishment in india if you're dealing with a treaty situation now the broader broadened definition of the dependent agent pe will make certain forms of independent agent as dependent agent primarily because of the manner in which these words have been extended so that's one part now let's look at some of the key concerns that are arising as i had mentioned earlier the certain forms of activities of non resident were specifically excluded from business connection rule for example purchase of goods and merchandise that has been removed okay it's largely aligned to the position india has taken in article 12 which triggers of an amendment to the commissioner arrangement it will be applying to non treaty jurisdiction till entry into effect of the mli so let's assume that you're dealing with a dependent agent pe of a non resident with which india does not have a double tax treaty because there is no treaty protection and the domestic law has been amended these amended provisions which is broad basing dependent agent pe definition will apply from this year itself as far as the modified tax treaties are concerned we will have to wait and see depending on how india completes the process of mli next slide please the other important change is on digital taxation introduction of significant economic presence the significant economic present test has been introduced with several modifications that have been undertaken to the law we have just listed down two important modifications you have to read both these in the context of interim report that was released recently by the oecd on action point 1 and i read this again it says transactions for goods services or property carried out in india including download of data and software in india if the aggregate payments for transactions exceed a certain prescribed limit these limits have not been prescribed whereas you are very familiar with the limits that have been prescribed by the eu commission in its draft legislation before which is before the eu parliament we don't know what limit will be prescribed in india now interestingly it does it just doesn't cover e-commerce transactions for typical e-commerce players the likes of amazon and google and facebook it covers traditional forms of businesses for supply of goods and services as well even without a presence in india so the law simply says that even if you do not have a presence in india but you're selling goods or services into india using your platform then it would be deemed that there is a, uh, a presence in india and accordingly the treaty will be read in that manner again provided the treaty is a part of the covered tax agreement they have not prescribed a threshold however most of us feel that the threshold limits are likely to be much lower than what has been prescribed in the eu we need to wait for the law to evolve then it says systematic and continuous solicitation of business activity or engaging in interaction with prescribed number of users in india through digital means now this is very interesting this may not even generate a revenue it says systematic and continuous solicitation of business it doesn't say winning of business 
it doesn't say activity so let's assume that there is an e-commerce player which does not have a physical presence in india but it interacts with customers in india it uses the digital means to interact with customers that interaction clearly means that it is soliciting business from indian customers now how will the activity be taxed let's assume that in a particular year there is no business generated because solicitation is one activity generation of business is another activity well logically speaking the attribution should work on the revenues that are generated out of such solicitation or systematic and continuous solicitation now many of these terms that are used in the significant economic presence seem to have been partly borrowed from the uh, bets recommendation but many of these words are alien to india and our belief is that it would create a high degree of litigation exposure however there are ways and means to be able to mitigate some of this exposure by looking into uh, one the guidance that will be announced by the department of revenue as to what are the thresholds for transaction of goods assuming those thresholds are small then you really need to look into how do you go about doing solicitation on many of these e-commerce platforms so right now beyond flagging of the issues we are unable uh, to say anything more however we have put out a technical paper which is uh, which was released by a bna asia pacific just last fortnight on what are the nuanced issues that are arising out of the significant economic presence test and we will be happy to send this to gaia who will circulate uh, this four page write up on what are the nuanced issues in the context of significant economic presence test what we want to do uh, you know i'm just mindful of the time that we have uh, you know we have about uh, you know 25 minutes or so because we started a little late uh, but we have some distance to cover i have two case studies uh, one is the famous formula 1 case study and second is the uh, case study on e funds uh, these both are federal court decisions that were rendered in 2017 latter part of the year and these are very interesting decisions because one has gone against the taxpayer and one is in favor of the taxpayer uh, there are several learnings from these two decisions in the interest of time i am going to go through the first case study which is on formula 1 and thereafter i will jump straight to the next topic subject to availability of time we will come back to the second case study which is a e funds case study the first case study deals with formula 1 and it's a very interesting case study it may sound a little complex we have tried to simplify it but i will skip some of the important steps now we all understand formula 1 we all understand formula 1 brand we all understand that you need a circuit we all understand that there would be some degree of infrastructure and logistic support that would be made available at the formula 1 circuit which is the country in which the formula 1 race is conducted keeping formula 1 structure in mind we have put out in the slide what was the structure of formula 1 in india formula which is federation international is a not for profit organization and its principal regulatory body for holding major formula 1 events it had transferred all the tra- right commercial rights to formula 1 asset formula 1 asset management company and formula 1 asset management company really was the key company that was responsible for conducting of formula 1 event because the commercial rights were with formula 1 asset management formula international and formula 1 asset management entered into 
commercial license agreement with formula 1 world champion formula 1 world champion is a taxpayer over here was a taxpayer in india that sought a ruling that they should not be liable to tax because they do not have a presence in india now when they sought the ruling the authority on advance ruling does have the right to get into the facts of the case and that is how this structure emerged that you have a not for profit organization on the top which has assigned or transferred all the commercial rights to the formula 1 asset management company and formula 1 asset management company in turn has licensed all the rights to formula 1 world champion limited which was conducting the formula 1 event in india some of the other facts that came was that the formula 1 world champion company which was conducting the formula 1 event so the passes for formula 1 were issued by formula 1 world champion entered into what they call it as a race promotion contract with an indian company that owned the race circuit and this contract was for granting the right to host and stage and promote the racing event which was called the f1 grand uh, grand prix of india and the consideration for that was 40 million dollars there were separate agreements that were entered into by a company called artworks license sorry there was separate agreement that was entered into called artworks license between the taxpayer which is formula 1 champion and the indian company for use of certain marks and intellectual property and this is a normal uh, agreement that you enter into just to make sure that f1 trademarks and all other trademarks are protected next slide please now what did the federal court say the federal court held that the taxpayer which is formula 1 world champion had a permanent establishment in india on account of the following the court first examined the dis- examined the disposal test for coming to the conclusion that formula 1 had a permanent establishment in india it said that the circuit may be belonging to an indian company but it was at the disposal and control of formula 1 not just at the time the race was conducted but a fortnight prior to the race and a week after the race ended it said that just because formula 1 did not construct the race track is of no consequence because the disposal test merely says that you should have a permanent establishment or some form of a infrastructure or facility at the disposal and hence to say that there was a permanent establishment of formula 1 for 3 days is not the correct thing to do interestingly one of the observations that was made uh, that was not made by the federal court but that that was made by the lower authority which is the advance ruling authority was that the passes that were issued to customers had very clearly laid out that formula 1 reserves the right to invite people for this event which means that the right to invite people for that event was not with the uh, indian company though it was indian company's infrastructure though the customers were entering the premises of the indian company the only contract with the indian company was for protection of intellectual property of f1 the court also came to the conclusion that there is a degree of permanence that is there in the contract so it is not a one off contract that has been entered into by formula 1 world championship and by the indian company why did it come to that conclusion it said that the duration of the contract is for a period of 5 years with an option to extend that contract so the race promotion contract for which 40 million dollars were being paid to get the right to host and stage and promote the event was for 5 years so there was a degree of permanence 
it also said that there was a control by formula 1 of the circuit and that formula 1 had the right for holding that event and it is an integral part of the f1 calendar which is widely announced by f1 internationally that these are the countries these are the places in which they are going to hold the event and india is one of the place last but not the least it said that the formula 1 world champion is a business activity that business activity can be undertaken only based on the commercial rights that it has acquired and that the circuit on which the f1 event was undertaken fulfilled all the characteristics of a permanent establishment in terms of permanence in terms of dependence so on and so forth and last but not the least it also said that the circuit would be a fixed place of business and a virtual projection of the pe because the court said you have to give a context when you hold something as a pe and the context over here is a web of agreements the context over here is the permanence of the activity the number of days that the activities was undertaken including the preparatory work and more importantly that it was it the, the most important place for conduct of this activity was the circuit itself and the racing circuit hence would be a permanent establishment so this is a landmark case uh, and it has kind of uh, you know led several questions as to how india would interpret uh, the pe rules in such a strict manner because it's a federal court decision at the end of the day now having said that uh, we do not believe that this decision can be applied to other situations because of the context test that has been laid down by the federal court but this decision is in my view a clear indication of the strict source space rules that india is capable of following so uh, if we can move straight to slide number 11 uh, we can get on with other parts and then we will leave the case study on the 9th and the 10th slide uh, so that uh, we are able to uh, we are mindful of the time that we have at our hand let's now focus a little bit on how does india attribute uh, profits to a permanent establishment um why do we want to debate this we want to debate this uh, for a variety of reasons number one that uh, in the new world order whether it's got to do with significant economic presence test or it's got to do with broad basing of dependent agent pe uh, conclusion of contracts uh, habitually conclusion of contracts uh, it's not going to be very difficult for the tax administration to come to the conclusion that there is a permanent establishment and hence uh, the debate then shifts to so if there is a permanent establishment how do you go about determining the profits and this is where you know india could be uh, in the high risk category of countries because there are some rudimentary rules that we have for attribution of profits our debate on global formulatory approach versus transfer pricing far analysis approach uh, is a never ending debate uh, we have arguments on both the sides whether the global formulatory approach should be used or the transfer pricing approach should be used and hence this becomes in a way an area of risk and we felt that this would be a good topic to discuss uh, in the context of international tax developments now india has an age old rule called rule 10 and rule 10 essentially gives a very wide authority to the tax administration to allocate profits and it lays down essentially few principles for allocation of profits one is the principle of percentage of turnover second is the principle of proportion of the total profits uh, in accordance with the domestic law Uh, as it bears to the total receipts basically using uh, 
uh, profit level indicator, uh, whether the net operating margin or net profit margin, and then it says in any other manner. Now these are the three options that have been given to the tax administration. Essentially, it's a very wide discretion that has been given, and in a way. Before our transfer pricing law came in 2001, and even after our transfer pricing law of 2001, global formulatory approaches have been used by the Indian Tax Administration because it is enshrined in the statute itself. Now we all know the debate on use versus of global formulatory approach versus use of a more scientific. Uh, far analysis approach and that debate is there in india as well however in light of that debate profits which are allocated based on other economic indicators of the associated enterprises could vary from situation to situation now when in our global formulatory approach we use the definition of what is a turnover what is the total receipt our entire focus is largely on the gross income of the taxpayer but if we look at the global formulatory approach which is as a part of the un or oecd guidance it looks largely at the profit being allocated and the basis for allocation of profits of course whether it's under the indian rule 10 or the global formulatory approach by the un and the oecd the underlying common thread is what we call it as a same entity approach versus a different different entity approach in the context of far analysis in the next slide we organize we we try and debate on the arms length approach and as i mentioned the arms length approach bes bes besides being oecd's authorized approach Uh, is an approach that is there in the statute since the transfer pricing law came in which emphasizes on the separate entity approach and the normal transfer pricing principles however in situations of arms length approach we are in the middle of a debate on how do we treat intangibles whether those intangibles are arising out of transfer of very complex copyrights trademarks or very sophisticated technology or those intangibles are arising out of certain costs that are incurred in india which go to benefit the foreign associated enterprise but we have experienced that the arms length principle in india is complex not just because of intangibles but in some situations because of lack of availability of suitable comparables because of the integrated nature of the operations and hence the debate has been should we move to a profit split method and even in a profit split method the challenge is how do you allocate the residual profits so we've had all kinds of challenges and no wonder why we have 1800 judgments of the tax tribunal to be able to deal with the complex transfer pricing law now these in our view would assume center stage in the context of beps recommendation on intangibles particularly on hard to value intangibles and the positions that india has taken in the past we'll try and discuss it in the next slide what are the challenges that we see from an indian transfer pricing law standpoint when it comes to beps recommendation coupled with some of the changes that have been carried out in the domestic law but suffice to mention that the indian experience on use of global formulatory approach has been rather mixed experience and i don't think that there has been a any conclusive uh you know verdict uh, whether one approach has to be preferred over another approach the case law on uh, e funds that we have not discussed uh, essentially supports the 
authorized OECD approach and not the global formulatory approach. But the question before the court was not whether one is preferred over the other. The question before the court was attribution of profits to a permanent establishment wherein the taxpayers uh, have been asked, have, were following the authorized OECD approach. As a guidance to all our clients, we advise them that the only way to prevent any form of ad hocism in India would be to maintain transfer pricing documentation such that you are able to argue in the courts the authorized OECD approach because there is some scientific basis for attribution of profits under the OECD authorized approach. If you don't maintain the documentation or you are very confident that there is no permanent establishment but the tax authorities take a, a, they take a view which is contrary to your view, then the only thing that can save you and bring you to a more scientific approach is the transfer pricing documentation and hence we recommend that in situations of doubt, even if it is not an admitted position on permanent establishment, you maintain transfer pricing documentation. In the next slide, we move on to another important topic, which is principal purpose test. Um, how does it align with the Indian uh, GAR regulations? Now, the principal purpose test, uh, as we all know, is a minimum standard. And it essentially says that uh, treaty benefits will not be granted uh, uh, if it is reasonable to conclude uh, that obtaining of the benefit was one of the principal purposes, you know, which is what we have classified in our slides as an objective test. Uh, interestingly, when the draft Indian GAR law was designed, it looked similar to the objective test under PPT. However, the diluted form of GAR which was legislated, used the word, the main purpose instead of one of the principal purpose. Now let's assume for the sake of argument that there is no difference between main and principal, but still there is a lot of difference between the main purpose and one of the main purposes or the principal purpose and one of the principal purposes. And hence, it leads us to believe that the principal purpose test is wider in its application with the GAR and hence taxpayers will be uh, will be uh, you know kind of uh, motivated to follow the Indian GAR legislation. However, in situations where India and its treaty partners want to implement the minimum standard then in those situations, the minimum standards read even with the simplified LOB test would mean that your treaty provisions will be more stringent than the domestic law. Now, this automatically leads you to argue that shouldn't you take protection of the domestic law and say, until and unless the main purpose of my transaction is to claim a treaty benefit, you cannot invoke GAR or until and unless or until and unless one of the main purposes of the transaction uh, is to claim treaty benefit, you cannot invoke GAR. Now, I don't think we have a clear answer. The tax authorities in all the debate, including the debate that we had last week as a part of the EFA event, let this question unanswered. However, it is very clear from the way you read the PPT and the Indian GAR is that the Indian GAR is more beneficial to the taxpayer. Now, let's look at what is India's MLI position on PPT. It has opted the PPT with a simplified limitation of benefits clause. In the India's simplified limitation of benefits clause applies only to treaties where all treaty partners choose to apply the simplified LOB. And India has not notified Article 7.4. In other words, no bilateral MAP benefit will be available in a treaty abuse situation. So if there is a debate on availability or non-availability of treaty benefit, uh, 
on the ground that the treaty is being abused if india invokes the domestic gar taxpayers cannot sort the map resolution process to come to the conclusion which is an option that has been given as a part of the process i'm not going to focus a whole lot on this slide except for making two three important observations the tax on indirect transfer of assets at an offshore level with underlying assets in india is maturing this law now accompanies with itself a host of rules particularly rules that prescribe one the valuation methodology and two the attribution of profits after coming to the conclusion on valuation and more importantly the rules also prescribed certain compliances that have to be made there is one set of compliance that needs to be made by an independent chartered accountant who will allocate these values from an attribution principle standpoint and there is another compliance that needs to be made by the indian concern the indian company the subject matter of underlying interest which lies in that company from a compliance standpoint should there be any change in the offshore business structure of any multinational which has underlying operations in india underlying assets in india sorry now there are several open issues that are there we are not going to debate into that uh, suffice for me to mention an important landmark case for sanofi when we were dealing with the taxability of a french transferor to another french transferee company of an offshore company with an underlying asset located in india interestingly in this case the high court took a view that because under the india french treaty the right to levy tax on alienation of shares is with france india cannot invoke its indirect transfer rules so indirect transfers has to be treated in the context of a uh, tax treaty interpretation we come to uh, the last part of uh, our presentation which is on intangibles but before we get on to what india has done on intangibles to implement the beps recommendation i wanted to take you through a very important development uh, for which india has been in the news on the last several years which is on marketing intangibles uh, the marketing intangibles debate in india now is almost 7 years old uh essentially what the tax authorities have been doing is uh looking at expenses on advertising marketing and sales promotion being incurred by foreign multinational indian subsidiaries comparing those with indian companies incurring those expenses and the excessive advertising and marketing expenses are being subjected to a transfer pricing adjustment using what is called the bright line test and the underlying argument is that the excess marketing expenses are incurred towards brand building and since the legal owner of the brand is the headquarters it should be an adjustment that should be carried out in india now the debate and the dispute has gone past uh, the tax tribunal uh, the high court gave uh, you know different interpretation it gave one interpretation in the cases that were led by suzuki where it said that nothing is evident from the agreements that have been signed between suzuki japan and suzuki india which suggest that suzuki india will develop promote a brand by incurring advertising expenses and in light of that you cannot carry out any adjustment because in the first place it is not an international transaction for other set of taxpayers which were led by a batch on canon which were largely distributors the high court came to the conclusion that there could be a case of international transaction but it rejected the bright line theory and it prescribed a methodology to compute the arms length adjustment first by deducting the sales related expenses and second 
by use by by prescribing methodology that should be used for computing the adjustment on account of marketing intangibles a uh, lot of this data has been thrown out in slide number 15 which will help you track the cases in the post beps era uh, you know like most countries india has implemented the master files uh, penalties have been prescribed for not following the master files the master file recommendation though principally largely in line with the requirement uh, of the oecd uh, under action point 13 uh, the threshold limits are low um, uh, the concepts of constituent entity is identical to the one that has been prescribed in action point 13 uh the requirements of the master file further clearly provide that you have to list down uh associated enterprises which are engaged in development and management of intangibles and then a description of the activities of the multinational enterprise when it comes to approach towards the transfer pricing policy for such intangibles when it comes to development ownership and exploitation so the dmp functions have to be identified in the master file which obviously will be available uh, to the tax authorities my last slide is largely on two other developments that have taken place again largely aligned to uh, the oecd action points india did not have a concept of secondary adjustment in its law that has been introduced the secondary adjustment simply say to the extent there is a transfer pricing adjustment if those sums are not remitted those would be deemed to be loan and an arms length interest will be attributable for such uh, uh, adjustment if it is not remitted into india and then last uh, deals with uh, the interest cap uh, the interest cap again are largely aligned uh, to the oecd beps recommendation uh, which says that uh, 30% uh, of interest Uh, will be allowed rest will be carried forward for a period of 8 years so that is how the interest cap uh, will trigger off i will not get into the nuanced issues that are arising of the out of the last two developments but uh, both these changes were carried out in the budget of uh, 2017 and this is the first year uh, of its uh, implementation Thank you again Mukesh for sharing your knowledge with us and thanks to all attendees for joining us today. Thank you very much and good day to everyone.